Summit Investigates has been digging into issues that matter to people in north central Wisconsin for years, but we've never taken on something quite this large. Together, we spent the last two months investigating how many children are sexually abused in our area and how the suspects get to your children. Here's what we didn't expect. Two to three times a day, someone reports a child sexual assault somewhere in our viewing area, and at least once a day, a police investigation opens. We wondered, who are the suspects? We looked at a sample of about 650 investigations over the past four years. In those cases, 98% of the suspects were known to the victim. 38% were family members, 60% were friends and acquaintances, less than 2% were strangers, and 90% were men. Now, parents, you need to know this is happening in your homes by people you know and allow to be near your children. Stranger danger shouldn't be your main concern. So do you know what conversations you should be having with your child, the questions you should be asking, and the lessons that you should be teaching? This week we're covering it all, starting with a group of community leaders that are working to get ahead of this problem. Because one thing they all agree on is that this problem is real, and it's a cycle that needs to be broken. Cases almost always start with a report to police or social services. Now, we requested data across our 15-county viewing area. More than 400 police investigations into child sex assault happened in 2018. People also reported child sexual assault at least 180 or 850 times, that is, to social services last year. These numbers do overlap. Now, police investigations are frequently handed off to social services. And in turn, they hand off reports to police. Our goal is to show you how both these numbers decreased in our area as investigations progressed last year and what happened to the reports that never made it to court. Starting with social services. No one situation is the same as the next. Five counties gave us complete data from start to finish, so we use that as our sample. Those five counties reported 578 child sexual assaults to social services, but at the end of this process, only 12% were substantiated. Here's why. Once they get the report, what happens varies from case to case, but here's a quick overview. First, they determine if the abuse comes from a primary or secondary caregiver. Those are anybody who lives within the home of the child or anybody who's in a caregiving role. A teacher, a babysitter, a cousin, aunt, uncle, grandma, grandpa, dad, brother, sister. If it is, they determine whether at least one allegation meets the legal requirements of abuse. If it does, it's screened in. Last year, that happened 51% of the time. Child Protective Services Supervisor Krista Jensen says there are a lot of factors that play into that number. For example, a, a report might come in where a child says, you know, I was touched on the butt by my dad over the close. What we're, we need to know is, was that for the purposes of sexual gratification or grooming or something of that nature? You know, or was it dad walked by and gave their child a slap on the butt and... It, there was no sexual intent behind it. Even if a case is screened out, social services can offer services to that child and their family. Once a case is screened in, further investigation determines if the case is substantiated, a higher threshold but still lower than criminal levels. We have to have a preponderance of evidence, so 51 percent essentially we believe that this happened. That includes finding things like the act caused mental harm to the child or that the offender did it for sexual gratification. Those can be really frustrating when you have that gut feeling that something has happened, but you don't have the disclosure from the child and maybe nobody observed that to occur. And maybe this child doesn't have any sexually acting out behaviors or behaviors that would be indicative of sexual abuse. And your alleged maltreater says absolutely not. Your case is closed at that point because you don't have a preponderance of evidence to substantiate and move that case forward. Of those screened in cases, 24% were substantiated. But even if a case is not substantiated, the social worker is looking at how to keep the child safe. And again, services still can be offered. We want to give them the support and resources they need to keep their own family safe and stable so that we can back out and help those families that can't do that on their own. We requested data from 48 law enforcement agencies in our viewing area. 26 got us the reports in the time frame we requested. So remember, the numbers I'm about to present represent only about half of our local agencies. More than 400 police investigations into child sexual assault opened in our area last year. That's more than one every day. But that number drops off pretty quickly once we follow those cases through the investigation process. 
many wind up closed or unfounded. That happened to at least 119 cases in 2018. Unfounded is more so uh, a case where through investigation it's been established that the crime actually didn't occur. Administratively closed cases are a bit different. We're unable to prove that a crime did occur. At the same time, we may not be able to prove that a crime did not occur. Sometimes the family or victim won't cooperate or there simply isn't any or enough evidence to get to the next level. It doesn't mean nothing happened to that child, but the facts that we were presented with um, aren't, uh, don't lead to probable cause for an arrest on a case. At this point, we're left with at least 211 cases that moved on to an arrest, a referral to the DA for prosecution, or a referral for youth justice. But a referral to the DA doesn't necessarily mean an arrest. Just because we refer somebody for charges doesn't always mean that they ultimately decide that there's enough to prosecute or, or to go forward or that a conviction result. But even when an assault can't be proven, experts agree reporting is a crucial first step. Because what we do know is typically where there's one victim, there likely is another victim. Thorough investigation is really important. A case of child sexual assault has to pass a lot of high thresholds before getting here. Are you satisfied that that's sufficient time on this? 389 did so in the last four years in our area. 237 of those are closed. And of those closed cases, 18 or 5% went to trial. And our standard is beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a very high standard. So there are risks going to trial. There are risks for the offender if the offender is found guilty, and there are risks for the state if the offender is found not guilty. So most often, a case ends in a plea deal. Marathon County's District Attorney Teresa Whetstone says there are a lot of factors playing into whether a case goes to trial or is negotiated. The case can evolve, making the case either stronger or not as strong, depending. Um, that doesn't mean it impacts the believability or credibility of the victim, it's the provability. Even if the case is strong, she says they work with the alleged victim and ultimately what's best for them. We do not want to sacrifice a child's mental health um, to go forward with a trial if we can reach a resolution that meets the public safety, the interests of the victim, and ongoing rehabilitation of the offender. She says that often means they don't need to find the defendant guilty of all charges in order to get the result they want. The sexual assault charge carries with it a pretty high penalty. Um, other than homicide, it's really the highest penalty for child sexual assault. So if a case has multiple charges, more likely than not, some of those charges will be what's called dismissed but read in or dropped completely. Well, the court can take into consideration the circumstances of that charge that's dismissed and read in, which is why we use that a lot as prosecutors. It can aggravate sentencing at the time for the convicted offense. She says a plea deal ensures a conviction, that the defendant will get some treatment and counseling, and the public will be put on notice. That being said, 69% or 164 of the closed cases in the last four years were found guilty of at least one child sexual assault charge. Of the 18 that took that risk to go to trial, only three were found not guilty. Whetstone says in those cases, it's why compassion for the alleged victim from beginning to end is important. Even if it was a not guilty, I've had interactions where they've said, thank you. I can't tell you how much you've helped us and helped the child because we stood up for them. Now, of these 389 court cases filed, only 15 were female. It's males and it's females and it's moms and dads. Um, it's brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, cousins. Inside your homes and the places your child feels safe. Out of a sample of more than 650 police investigations into child sexual assault over the last four years, 251 suspects were part of the household or related to the victim. Only 12 suspects were total strangers. But at least seven times that number were parents or step-parents. More fathers than stepfathers. And we know that another 21 suspects were boyfriends to the victim's mother. But the offender we almost never found, mothers. In the sample size, we found just two, and one was unfounded. But behind these numbers, are the stories of broken families. Obviously, it really rips families apart. I have seen time and time again where there's like two sides. Part of the family's on the victim side, the other part of the family's on the perpetrator side. And there are some people who just believe the perpetrator and can't believe that he or she would have done that and think the child is lying. 
And when a suspected offender is part of the support network for the family, those consequences can escalate quickly. They might need housing now because the alleged maltreater might have been mom's primary source of income. And so now uh, mom is upset with them because maybe mom's boyfriend has to move out. And so now mom is upset because um, she doesn't have the financial income to help pay her rent. Um, and she's crying all the time and she's upset. And so sometimes kids will feel like it's their fault that now mom is sad and mom doesn't have a boyfriend and mom can't pay rent. Outside that family circle, about 57% of the suspects are everyone imaginable. Boyfriends, girlfriends, and exes. We know of at least 111 of those. The rest? Friends, family friends, classmates, online friends, parents, employees, babysitters, babysitters' boyfriends or children, other caregivers, friends' parents, friends' children, sisters' boyfriends, daycare providers, teachers, coaches, and more. And while it can be anyone, we found more than 90% were male. And the female suspects are frequently working with a male or are a minor themselves. That's why Detective Jess Stefanik encourages parents to primarily include females in a child's network of trusted adults. It does um, limit the chance that you're telling your child to trust somebody who is um, a possible per perpetrator. But at the end of the day, what we learned, you can find anyone on this list. Hold up a mirror because you could be a victim or you could be a maltreater. It's not uncommon, sometimes we'll be with a family at our child advocacy center and a parent will say, oh my goodness, I never thought that this would happen to my daughter too. Generation after generation, that's just one way child sexual assault keeps damaging families. We've been calling it a cycle all week. Now, Naomi Coles tells us why. Imagine a three-pronged triangle. You have victim, perpetrator, rescuer. Oftentimes when someone, someone has been victimized, they get what we call stuck in the triangle, where they shift positions in taking one of those three roles. Shipway explains that a victim will sometimes move to a rescuer's role before they're ready to help others. If they're spending an inordinate amount of time doing that and not taking care of their own needs, that's what makes it unhealthy. Others stay in the victim's corner because it feels familiar, even normal. A woman who's been sexually abused as a child marries a man who's abusive to her physically as well as sexually or, or maybe just physically. And the subconscious goes, oh, I know that. Even if it's bad, that seems familiar. That's what I know, so I'm going to be attracted to that. And finally, the victims who become perpetrators. But subconsciously, if I abuse a child, at, usually at the same age of when I was abused, I feel powerful. I feel like I have control. And so subconsciously, I feel like I'm getting back at my perpetrator. And for Marathon County's District Attorney, Teresa Whetstone, that last pattern is one she's seen many times in her career. There's something in that person's past that they have lived with, kept a secret, never gotten treatment or counseling for. It's for these reasons that professionals say rehabilitative programs are so important. Well, it's really naive, naive of us to think we'll just lock them up and then we'll be done with them. And for victims, it's about helping them find that new normal. The next thing I know, my, my chest was closing and my anxiety just hit and I couldn't, I didn't know which direction to go. Heidi Wolf was trying to write a message. What would you say to little Heidi? I, I think that's the hardest part is I, I don't, right now I don't know what to say to little Heidi. She was sexually assaulted at eight years old by her own step-grandfather. But then it happened again when she was 41. The second time, it was, it was like an explosion, and I couldn't seal it, couldn't, couldn't hold it back anymore. She wasn't the only victim in her family. I would say we didn't know, and we never talked about it. And while too much time had elapsed for the crimes against her to be charged, others in her family did get justice knowing that 12 strangers um, believed in us and we heard guilty. And then a letter came. Even to this day, I don't go to the mailbox. From her grandfather in prison. If, if he had put an innocent person in prison, he wouldn't be able to sleep either. M my body just started to itch to the point of what it was like the day after the assault. And then I knew I, I hadn't done anything wrong. The, the biggest thing I did it for was to protect my kids. I got to crown my daughter homecoming queen. And in that moment, I knew 
I protected and kept things intact for her. 